All right, folks, we are joined once again by NIST fellow, the great and powerful Dr. Ron Ross, uh, hot on the heels of the release of NIST SP-800-171 Revision 3 Final Draft and NIST SP-800-171A Revision 3 Initial Draft. Sir, how are you? Doing great, Jacob. I was just thinking the time frame between your podcast and when we drop the documents getting shorter and shorter. I'm not sure yeah. that's the design, but, uh, it, you know, it, it worked out, I think pretty well. Uh, you know, we were, uh, excited and ready and, um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of a hobby around these parts to, to read I, what you guys put out. And so I think, uh, you know, getting that turnaround time as short as possible is something we, we pride ourselves on. And it's good to see you and, uh, Jason today. This is the first time we've ever had pleasure of seeing him on the podcast with us. So it's good to see him as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, we have a bunch of stuff to get into. Uh, so uh, let's just let's just dive right in and uh, and get into uh, a couple of questions that we had about about these most recent revisions. So just to start at sort of an overview level, there's a lot of people who uh, will be exposed to NIST uh, 800 for the first time with these drafts uh, in the lead up to the next revision as various federal regulations that include them by reference come out. So at a very high level, can you maybe just describe what 800-171 is uh, and, and what it represents? Sure, the um, 800-171 was developed, probably I think it's going on, it's almost 10 years old. We started development back in 2014 and there it was a result of a previous executive order that came out uh, on controlled unclass information I think it, the original EO was around 2010. Now, on the federal side, uh, that executive order, um, it asked NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, to do two things. Number one, get a handle on all the different data types that the federal government was using. It was pretty much out of control at that time. And secondly, once you've narrowed it down to a, uh, an established uh, set of data types, then make a statement on what kind of protection measures those that data should be receiving. So it was kind of a two-part ask on the part of the executive order. And so NARA did that. They spent about two years. They assembled every federal agency. They went through all the data, data types that were currently on the table, and they cut them down to about 82 categories and subcategories of these data types. We call them CUI categories. Now there are no longer subcategories. They're all categories. And then they set out to establish the protection measures. Now, we had already been working in this space as far as data protection for a long, long time under the Federal Information Security Management Act. We had developed the risk management framework, the NIST 853. Uh, it's gone, it had gone through um, several revisions at that point. And so they chose the moderate baseline uh, as the level of protection. Now, I know you know, and many of your uh, viewers may not know, that NIST has three baselines, a low, a moderate, and a high-impact baseline. Now, these were designed specifically with the intent that we have a very large federal agency space, lots of different federal agencies, the number of missions, business operations, technologies, it's all over the map, very diverse infrastructure. So we came up with a catalog of security controls. We didn't have privacy controls initially. Those came in later. And we took of that large catalog of controls, we allocated into three starting, we call them starting sets of controls, the low baseline, the moderate baseline, and the high baseline. Each of the baselines built on each other. So the low baseline was the first one created. And then when you go to the moderate level, that moves from um, just an, a minimal impact to a serious impact. When, when that was your situation, you go from the low to the moderate, we added controls and control enhancements. And then when you go from the serious adverse um, impacts to severe or catastrophic potential adverse impacts, then you move to the high baseline again, take the moderate and you add more things to it. The idea is as the impact level gets higher, um, you have more to lose in, in that cyber attack. Uh, and so it stands to reason that the protection, the safeguards would increase as you go from low to moderate to high. So those controls were always uh, characterized as starting sets because 
every agency would then take those baseline controls and they would go through a tailoring process. And we described that in pretty good detail in 853. It's now in the 853 Bravo publication because the baselines have been moved out to a separate publication. But an agency could always tailor up or down. They may have situations where they can tailor out a control because maybe the technology couldn't support it and they have to use compensating controls. Many cases, the agencies wanted to add a control or a control enhancement here or there for their specific mission needs uh, that we couldn't anticipate. So, and I know you know this, you've stated this many times, that NIST had to develop a catalog of controls that could handle all of the types of cyber threats across a diverse federal agency uh, space, if you will, and at the same time, give every agency the flexibility it needed to do the job. So it was always a balancing act. How hard could it be? Yeah, how hard could it be? Exactly. <laughs> that would be a couple pages long. Well, so we already had um, 853, and the moderate baseline was chosen as the level of required protection for controlled unclassified information on the federal side. So that was already in place. Now, don't forget, on the federal side, our baselines cover all three objectives of cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So we had a complete set already in place. It was not a heavy lift for NAR to select that baseline. Mm -hmm. CUI couldn't legitimately be categorized as low, otherwise it wouldn't be special and it wouldn't make much sense. High impact was a little bit overkill. However, there are certain types of CUI that could move up from moderate to high. Um, witness protection program information may, for example, fall in that category. I'm not sure that's the case, but there are certain things that are really highly sensitive that may require going above that moderate baseline. So now we're looking at the feds are taken care of. And now uh, we're looking at a situation where, okay, we do a ton of business with the private sector industry. You know, all that new technology, all the innovation that's going on in the private sector, we're consumers of that technology. So we have agreements and contracts that we establish with the private sector, with industry. And now we have a situation where our controlled on class information is moving over the fence. It's going from our side to the non-federal side. Well, what do we do? Well, this executive order um, requires us to make sure that there are adequate protections. A federal agency doesn't take it has the responsibility under FISMA for protecting all information, including CUI. Now, when the, when the CUI moves over the fence to a non-federal organization, that responsibility doesn't go away. The feds still have to make sure that appropriate safeguards and countermeasures are in place. So that was what started the initial thinking. What do we do? Well, we started with, there was a continuum. One con in continuum on the, on the high end of the continuum said, Let's just make them all do the moderate baseline, then we're done. That'll be easy. It was like but 260 was some odd controls, yeah. Yes, it, w it was unrealistic for several reasons. We started to think about, okay, it covers confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What is this executive order actually tasking this to do um, and NARA? And it was not to cover all of the objectives. It was to cover the unauthorized disclosure of CUI, the confidentiality mm -hmm. aspect. Now, we can get into later the relationship of confidentiality to integrity. As it turns out, at the mechanism level, you largely get the same stuff. If, you know, integrity and a, a confidentiality, they kind of run in the same lane because it's about access control. And those mechanisms have to be in place, whether your policy is for unauthorized uh, modification or unauthorized disclosure. It's kind of the same mechanistic uh, view of the problem down at that level. Right. So now we said, OK, DOD at the time had been working with industry uh, to try to push out a, a certain number of controls. Now, don't forget, back in 2009, one of the things that we did at NIST is we reached out to the DOD and the intelligence community. We said, we have an offer that we don't think you can refuse. You've, the DOD had their, you remember these, the IA controls. That was part of their framework back in the day. It was tied to the DIA cap, and before that, the DITS cap. That was how they did certification and accreditation. All the old timers out there remember that. Oh yeah. And then the Intel community had DSCID six slash three. That was their control set. So I took a look at those over time, and I said, "This was about in 2007 or eight. And I said, "Look, we've got a really robust catalog. When you compared 853 to the ISO 27001 slash two, 
if you do a mapping, there was a lot of white space on the ISO side because our catalog sure is. is very broad and very deep. Mm-hmm. So I went to the DOD and the Intel folks and I said, look it, why don't you consider partnering with us? We'll take the responsibility of developing all the controls for the federal government. You can bring us everything you have. We'll incorporate. You can be part of the team. That was the birth of the joint task force. And we, we started the partnership and they agreed surprisingly to my surprise, they agreed to that and they ended up adopting five publications, the RMF, they adopted um, the 800-30, 37, 53, 53 alpha and 839. And they adopted them on a voluntary basis because NIST doesn't have the statutory authority to force DOD or the Intel folks to do anything. They have to come to NIST voluntarily and they did. It was a great partnership. The Joint Task Force is still in effect today. They brought me all of their controls from DSCID and, and the IA controls, and we integrated all of those seamlessly into the catalog. There's, it kind of spawned a lot of new enhancements, obviously, uh, but that's okay yeah. because the yeah. catalog was supposed to be a, I, I, I always talk about it as a great parts bin. You go into an auto parts store and you look at the auto parts, and I can build a Corvette or I can build a, a Yugo. Maybe not a Yugo anymore, but back in the day, I could build a Yugo. Um, so th- those baselines, getting back to the baseline. So we started with the modern baseline. We said, well, this is not realistic to ask those non-feds, our partners, to do all the modern baseline. It would have caused a maybe a tissue rejection at the best and maybe a revolution at the worst. Yep. Um, so we sat down and um, I approached NARA and because they were part of the executive order, obviously, the executive agent. And DOD had been working with the DOD over the years to push out 50 controls, 25, 75. They were trying to do the the right number. And they had mixed success over those years. Um, So we sat down together and we said, "Okay, let's start with FIPS 200, um, which is a very high level statement of requirements. At the time, and we're going to be updating 200 sometime because we have more families now in the 53. But at the time, it had 17 um, major category, uh, major requirements, very highly stated. They're very general requirements. And the way that you would satisfy those top level, high level general requirements was you would pick a baseline, tailor the baseline, agree upon a set of controls, lock them in, and then implement. Mm-hmm. And so th- this was kind of the risk management framework. The RMF was designed to be a fully functional framework that had every supporting publication. You would categorize, you would select your starting set of controls, you would tailor, Mm -hmm. you would then lock those controls in, you'd implement, you'd assess those controls to see if they were effective, operating uh, as they should be. And then um, that was through an assessment process, could be a self-assessment or it could be independent third party, depending on what baseline you selected. And then eventually you get to the authorization decision, which is the risk management decision that the senior leader makes saying, here's what I'm protecting. Here's what I've done to protect. I know I've got residual vulnerabilities because you can't ever be perfect in this world. And that those residual vulnerabilities translate to some level of residual risk. And is that within my risk tolerance? Right. That's, the, that's the decision process that every agency goes through on the federal side. So now we got FIPS 200 and we said, okay, this looks like a great place to start because those requirements are stated very highly. And then we can bring in 853 and tailor the 853. And we did that. And that's what you see in that initial version of 800171. The first thing, the easiest thing for us to do was to tailor everything that was federally unique out of that baseline. Those are which pretty awesome. Which is, I think people are often surprised how how little of 853 would be considered to be strictly federal unique. Uh, exactly. Although it used yeah. to have the word federal in the title of the document. I think people are often surprised to see that uh, very little of it is wholly unique to federal environments. This is one of the things I've been pushing for almost 20 years. I, I think I recognize very early on though that even though we're in the federal government, we're using largely commercial technology. You know, the, gone are the days where we did these big GOTS projects where we're building specialized systems. Even NASA, who builds a lot of specialized stuff, they have a lot of commercial products they import. Right. Now, that's good news and bad news because that technology is the latest and greatest, but it also it's increased our attack surface tremendously. But what I learned is our entire business boils down to computers made of hardware, software, firmware, and those are in, those end up 
being um, built into systems and systems of systems. So there really isn't a whole lot of difference on the federal or private sector side when it comes to security requirements or security controls. Our partners in the private sector, now there's probably a difference in how they're doing things and the specifics, but in general, cybersecurity is pretty cut and dry. There, there's the, When you go across all of our 20 families, we cover the waterfront of different topics. Right. And I know you don't like the fact we took out the designations of management, operational, and technical, but a <laughs> lot of these controls are overlapping. And each control that you look at, even in the AC family, there are management, operational, and technical aspects to those controls almost across the board. Right. So I always took your point about, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing more information out of the document. There was a reason for that, but I do also understand what you're saying, that a lot of people who are not familiar with the guidance you know, can use that in, in a very helpful manner. Yeah. Um, so we took everything out that was federal. And then we decided that um, we were going to start to take out everything that was not specifically related to unauthorized disclosure. So right away, availability related controls came out. That was the easy part right. because continuity of operations, contingency planning, and then the integrity, we, we did a little bit of slicing and dicing on the integrity. But as I said before, most of the confidentiality controls that ended up in the 171 or the requirements also support integrity. So it's kind of a twofer. We have a footnote that says that, but yet even though we say it, people always say, well, there's nothing about integrity in there, but it's not true. Got to read the footnotes, people. It's the most important part. Read, especially in this documents, that's what part of the problem is. We have a lot of footnotes and that's where a lot of juicy information ends up being sure put. Is. The other thing I want to stress at this point is that there's a common misconception. I hear it all the time that 800-171 is a standard. It is not a standard. It is a guidance document. Um, we have three different types of publications that we do at NIST. One is an actual standard, but that's got a, a, a label on it called FIPS, Federal Information Processing Standard. The next type of document, which is much more common. We don't do a lot of standards. We got, you know, FIPS 140 and all the offshoots of that. We have some crypto standards, but there aren't many. FIPS 200, FIPS 199. Uh, you could probably count the number of standards, um, you know, uh, under 20 probably. The SPs, the special publication is the second. Those are guidance documents. Now, what that means is that they're, they're they're not mandatory for federal agencies in the sense that a FIPS is. A FIPS is mandated by statute. A special publication is a guidance document. And the intent of OMB, they call a lot of our SPs out in their A130 policy. Right. But they're intended to be used by the federal government to implement uh, the guidance in the best way possible that supports their missions, business operations, their technology, and all the things that federal agencies have to do to carry out their missions across this very diverse infrastructure they have. The other type of document, which is kind of one level down from the SP is called an, an IR, interagency report. That's where we'll put out some information that's maybe research and development related. It's not quite ready for an SP or maybe down at a technical implementation level where we really can't apply that across the board. Gotcha. So. Well, I, guess, I guess a quick question here, cause I, I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure people are typing up their comments right after you said that. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people cite that language out of 171 or out of 53, uh, and they'll say, well, this is a guidance document. This is not a standard. This is a guidance document. These are not requirements. And then as right. a result, they'll say, well, this is now up for debate. And these baselines are now, uh, they have a bunch of wiggle room and they're in doubt and they aren't actually you know, we don't actually need to do everything that's in these baselines and so on and so forth. I think the the takeaway so far, I mean, this history is, is fascinating, it, it very clarifying. I think the, the big takeaway is that the 800 document is derived from a long history of risk-informed development decisions. It is reflective of the government's risk perspective and tolerance over controlled unclassified information. It's not off on some island by itself, yeah, but how, exactly does this, right. how does this guidance document play when the normal person listening to this podcast hears, well, it's just guidance versus uh, they're being required to do it to protect CUI? Well, look, at we, we all live in the real world of actual implementation. You can take the best standard, the best guidance document, 
it's on the shelf. And until it moves off the shelf into the hands of the consumers, the customers, that's why I always call the people that I deal with, um, they're customers. Right. I work for them. My job at NIST is to lead a team that produces the best technical standards and guidelines we can possibly produce. They have different names, different covers, but the, the real world says once that guidance comes off the shelf and goes into the real world, now you're bending sheet metal and you're coding and you're putting all those things together. And the real world has a lot of messiness to it. So on the federal side, even people who protect CUI on the federal side, there has always been the notion that you start with the modern baseline and you tailor. Right. Now, if you take out certain controls from your baseline, we've always required that people um, have a rationale or a justification for why that's possible. That's to protect them from auditors or the IG or the GAO who comes rumbling through their security plan and says, hey, this is in the baseline. It's not, it's not in your implementation. What happened? Well, you gotcha. can say, I've got a 1966 <laughs> Navy computer that only has 8-bit characters and it can't do this or that. I mean, I don't know why it has to be a Navy computer. I don't know if that's... Well, that. because the Navy has, as you know, <laughs> the history of the oldest computers. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just it's, joking. It's your Navy, but... <laughs> former Navy. But um, the truth is that there is a lot of um, things that can cause a compensating control to be necessary. And we always recognize that. And that's why that catalog is so rich and deep. So you can pull other controls out right. and use that. Because, because if you were to say that NIT, for whatever reason, NIST 53 were a standard, then that flexibility suddenly kind of goes out the window, right? It's a lot more, a lot more yeah. difficult. And my, you know, the, the, the case that I always use, I, and I never like using real cases, but since I was a victim of this horrendous attack, uh, and you were too, um, this is the one where they took all the OPM, the uh, SF-86. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Devastating attack. Now, so I always, even if your computer system was the oldest on the planet, and that's where you chose to store that data, if you knew it was that vulnerable, and even if you were doing an upgrade, you could move that into a vault and put a Marine with an M16 in front of it. And that's a good compensating control. You know, it it makes sure, you know, you, you can't get the information out as quickly, <clears throat> but it's but right. it, it would stop that um, that cyber attack from doing a complete clean out of all the information and taking mm -hmm. everything. It's about making the adversary's job more difficult, increasing the workload. And you sure. see that theme being carried out in our 8160 or engineering publications. Um, we really today have a, we don't really have a cybersecurity problem as, as much as an engineering problem, but that's a, that's a discussion for a different day. Yeah. But I should say the feds are always expected to tailor, document their rationale and then make your argument because Look at when you tailor out a control as a let's say you're advising the authorizing official, they're going to probably take your word for it. You've done the analysis on the security architecture and all the things that went into that recommendation. You recommended that we get rid of this control. Well, the AO has got to stand up and say, I accept that decision. I'm going out. We're we're not stopping the mission because we can't do one control. We've got always mission first. So the feds have been doing that for a long time. You know, and now. You know. Sorry. So I guess in that case, right. So this, this idea of tailoring, which we're going to visit the details, I think of the tailoring reflected in the draft, you know, this implies that these controls that are, that are represented in 171 as derived from 53 exist in an environment that is designed to be tailored and changed. So yes. if 171 is also a reflection of the government's risk tolerance over CUI and 171 is changing is one way that people can think of these drafts and these pending changes as the government is changing and updating their thinking on risk regarding CUI as documented in? in I think that's a fair thing. You know, when we update um, 800 it, it's it's a different publication, obviously. This is one of the things we'll talk about later why we're moving back to the uh, overlay concept, because we have too many different things going on. Sometimes it can confuse people. But yes, I think that's a, that's a, a, a fair characterization. You know, these documents all of them were never intended to be set in stone. You can't operate in the world, the modern world of technology, computing technology with a with an adversary that has moved from somebody in a basement trying to do some, you know, some funny stuff to nation state adversaries who have the best technology, mm -hmm. some of the best people and a lot of time on their hands. And I, I put out a LinkedIn post last night about capability, intent and targeting. Those are the three criteria we use to judge an adversary. And you, you, can, um, you can be sure that NIST 
moving forward from when FISMA started in 2003, our job in building this framework, the RMF and all the, the catalog of controls, it is always meant to be a living document. So every update, we are looking to what, ki what kinds of cyber attacks have we been hit with over the years? There's tons of empirical data that we gather and we can learn from. And then we have to anticipate what could the adversary do to us in the future that we haven't seen thus far. So you can see, and then you roll all that in with a, an attack surface that's growing at a rate that's out of control as far as complexity goes. And now we have to anticipate a whole new generation of zero day vulnerabilities that are lurking there because we just haven't uncovered them in the big haystack yet. It's yeah, a daunting and, and, problem. You know, at the time of this conversation, like you said, with your with your LinkedIn post, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in that post was that 172, 800, 172 would be uh, so have some updates coming as well. So is, does the same principle hold for 172 same. as for 171? It's, it's a reflection of government thinking on risk for a certain situation and updates and revisions are a reflection of updates and revisions to government's thinking on risk in that. Absolutely. Way? Absolutely. Okay. In fact, um, you know, we've moved a lot of our 853 and 53 alpha content to the new CPRT website. Um, that's a that's going to be a game changer for a lot of people. All that content now is, <clears throat> is going to be searchable online so you can go right to it. We just added in these incremental updates we're now doing uh, that new control IA13 with the, which is three enhancements. <clears throat> that was a reflection of a gap that we discovered after a cyber attack. Yeah. And so the, for, for NIST to have the ability, you know how standards development can be excruciatingly slow, even guidance documents. I remember we were on a three-year cycle for 53 that ended up turning into a five-year cycle. I would argue you can't live in the world of cybersecurity for standards updates that only occur every three to five years. Sure. Well, so this is what makes our CPRT project so critical. We've got to be able to listen to the customers, listen to our Intel community who are out there on the point discovering, listen to industry. They're out there on the point too. A lot of these cyber attacks that come in and these new attacks are coming to industry partners first, and maybe we get hit second. But that's why that public-private partnership is so critical, so we can share information, and then this can move quickly to establish those new safeguards, get them into the, the catalog, and in this case, the I-13 is not part of a baseline, but that illustrates the point. Yeah. It's now available for you to snatch and implement and, and hopefully close down a vulnerability that you have. So if you want to roll this into the 171 discussion, the same thing is true. We went from Rev 4 to Rev 5. We have a lot of new content now. So 171 can't be an outlier because if we're protecting CUI on the federal side to one set of uh, controls, we have to have that equivalent level of protection on the non-federal side because the information doesn't lose value just because it goes over the fence. Right. Um, and also, this is a, another really important discussion about the cost of for small and mid-sized businesses. I get that argument. Uh, and it's not a, a, a NIST thing, something we can do about, because our job, as I said before, is to produce the best, the tech, the, the, the best standards, guidelines, from a technical perspective, right. how they're implemented and the cost of implementation is clearly an issue for small and mid-sized businesses. But at the end of the day, that information, that CUI could be part of a critical program, yeah. a high value asset. And that information is just as valuable to that adversary if it's being protected at DHS or DOD or the intelligence community as it is if it's out in a small mom and pop outfit, you know, or so maybe some- Right, if the, if the criterion for- tailoring yeah. the baseline were to make it as affordable as possible, then your ability oh, yes. to have assurance yeah. over risk to your data is now suddenly a huge problem. So it's definitely a, it's definitely a tough set of trade-offs. You know, I'm at, as you're explaining this sort of federal shift into the non-federal world, uh, one of the things that people will see when they open 171 is what it, it basically opens with this description of the difference between the federal perspective and the non-federal perspective on the same set of requirements contained right. in 171. Could you just maybe summarize, uh, you know, how should people think about the, that that perspective when where they're in conflict, where they're in alignment, you know, before we dive into some of the specifics that sure. are in the drafts? 
Well, the federal, you have to think of it as two sides of the, of the same coin. The federal perspective is we have a set of controls in 853, and we have all the stuff that we've been doing on the federal side. And that's our, that's our world. That's our domain. Now we're, we're working with partners, industry, academia. There's agreements. There's contracts. There, there, there's a need for a level of protection out there on the industry side. So the non-federal perspective side is the recipient of everything required to protect that CUI. They're sitting on the other side of the fence waiting for us to dump those controls and requirements into a contract or um, into an agreement. And this is not just a CMMC DFARS issue. I always say that NIST 853 is a guidance document. It doesn't get weaponized until it goes into a law, a regulation, or some kind of a federal policy. And that's called weaponizing a NIST guidance document. That means that now everything I said about being a guidance document, having a significant amount of flexibility, that flexibility now is in the hands of what the regulation says and what the policy says and what the law might say. So and that's a whole other I, that's a whole other can of worms, right? Is it's a whole but it doesn't mean that it's immutable because even with a regulation or a law that or a policy that calls out a set of requirements or controls, however you want to refer to them, that that is ends up being the subject of a contract negotiation. When they go out in the contract, there is going to, every contract is going to have a federal entity on the other end of that that's managing that contract, that agreement. Right. And, you know, as you've seen in the DOD's world, they, 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 you go through these um, iterations of the requirements go out, they come back, they're, some are implemented, some are not. There's a negotiation, there's what, what is acceptable. Right. They go into plans of action, milestones can be, something very minor to, hey, we didn't do any of the 110, you know, I got a poem that's everything. So you have this entire range of things out there. And when you get to the DIB, and of course the DOD is, is like, the, that's the biggest customer base ever because you have so many hundreds and thousands of contractors, small, medium and large, big five, big six defense contractors, all the way down to the small mom and pops. And it's enormously diverse. Man. And yet, as are the data to, flows, the data flows are tremendously yeah. diverse too. We're asked to manage all of that um, and try to mitigate the risk of a devastating cyber attack that can. It doesn't have to be the you know the design docs for the F thirty five. It can be a small part. I think uh, you might have brought this up in one of your previous podcasts. Um, I, I heard it somewhere, but I, I remember talking about a widget that goes into a DOD system, that widget may seem unimportant to the small group producing it, but it becomes part of a parts diagram of a larger component. I think you, you might have been referred to the O-rings that, you know, in the NASA, in the Challenger disaster. Right. Each individual piece part, when you're looking at that from your perspective, it's just a widget. But when it goes into a larger design, which has interrelationships and there become dependencies, it could become a single point of failure. Sure. And that technology could also be very valuable to the adversary for two reasons. One, it may be cutting edge, something they haven't thought of, something they need. Or they could choose to try to launch a cyber attack to bring down that capability. That's what I put when I posted that, um, that on LinkedIn yesterday, the capability intent and targeting. I talked about the APT. Sometimes they want to steal stuff from you. That's bad enough when they're next-gen weapon systems look a lot like ours. Right. But they also might want to pre-position malicious code that can bring you down either now or at a time of their choosing. And don't forget this supply chain. That's where we added that new family of supply chain uh, requirements because we are all tethered together into this great, wonderful world of development. You know, in our country, we rely tremendously on the private sector that's what gives us the great technology that the warfighters use to win wars, but it's also our Achilles heel because the same innovation and technology that we depend on is down across that big, right. beautiful supply chain that goes down to those two guys in a garage or two gals from MIT that are working on that next generation widget that is going to absolutely be a game changer for the technology. So you can see how difficult and challenging a process yeah. it is. And we're just trying to make the best decisions that can have a reasonable chance of 
beaten these adversaries at their own game. Sure. And that's kind of where we, where, how we roll. You know, one of the other uh, perspectives on, on 171 that, that I, I try to bring up as much as possible uh, is the idea that as described in 171, that the, the, the list of requirements are a list of outcomes. And uh, I always find this to be a hot button topic uh, in discussions, especially online, where you know, people characterize the requirements as being very prescriptive, but the document characterizes them as outcomes. And this is in contrast yeah. to what people would traditionally think of something as outcomes like the NIST cybersecurity framework. So is it still the case that 800-171 is a list of outcomes? And as it goes through this revision process, it will continue to be a list of outcomes. Is that the proper way to think about the contents of, of the guidelines? I like to think of them as outcome based. We, you know, 853 went through a transition and something else I know you didn't like. We took away the intro to every control. It used to say the information system does this or the organization does that. Right. And again, in moving toward more outcome-based controls, we took away those initial reference because as it turns out, again, you have the same problem. You have um, a control, a capability. I like to think of them as capabilities or outcomes. They, sometimes they're technical-based and sometimes they're organizational-based or sometimes it's a combination of both. And so pigeonholing these outcomes or the, or the, or the capabilities into a single area was problematic. Now, I like to think of it as outcomes for one reason or capabilities. That is, we try to build our control catalog and the requirements can kind of follow that same theme as being technology neutral and policy neutral. Those are, that's done for a reason. And there's a reason why we don't provide implementation details for every one of these controls or requirements, because we would have an endless number of commercial products where those can, were going to be implemented from Linux based systems to, you know, Apple systems to, right. um, you can just see the, the, the plethora of technology. So, but it does get to a larger point there. It, it's not, it's difficult to implement security controls and also implement these requirements. Why? Because it's like if you're cooking a meal and you're not a, you know, an accomplished chef, you can't just go into the kitchen and throw stuff together. Right. <laughs> you got to have a little bit of knowledge. Now, maybe that knowledge is from the school of hard knocks, like most of us bachelors did in our first couple of years. We were out there rumbling around the kitchen, putting together a bunch of stuff that most people wouldn't eat. Hot but dogs over, and ramen, baby. That's my, that was the go-to. <laughs> <laughs> but over time, either you um, learned how to cook or you... Um, or you ate out a lot. You know, that's, sure. the, that's the other alternative. Well, but, you know, this is this is one of my favorite metaphors. I'm glad that you brought it up because this, uh, this you know, on this idea of outcomes versus prescriptive requirements, if you will, if you have a cookbook and it only contains outcomes, then there wouldn't be any recipes in the cookbook. It would just be a picture of the finished dish. And I, I think this is sort of uh, a point I would like to maybe press you on a little bit before we get into the general changes if we're creating guidelines and standards that turn into requirements and obligations that are outcome based, then mm -hmm. is there a certain level to continue the metaphor of knowledge that is prerequisite to being successful at implementing and meeting the requirements? Like, is there, is there a certain level of, of security and engineering knowledge that I need to be able to read the outcomes without the recipes, just like I would need a certain level of of knowledge of how to cook if I were going to look at pictures of dishes that don't have recipes? Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. Now, before everybody jumps up and down and says, well, I have five people in my organization. They're not computer scientists or engineers. What do I do? Let's set that aside for a moment because we're talking about computers, computing technology, software, firmware, hardware, systems. These things don't just happen overnight or by happenstance. There are dedicated professionals that build systems, software engineers, hardware engineers, computer engineers. It's like, it's like an automobile. Mm -hmm. If I told you that your car that you were going to buy off the lot was thrown together by the first 20 people off the street, you probably wouldn't be driving it, or at least want to drive that car. 
Computer security and system security is part of a larger engineering effort. Now, it's true that a lot of the engineering is done by the private sector. We have great companies out there that build tremendous systems, software, hardware. Is it perfect? No. Trillions of lines of code, billions of devices. They're bringing them all together with 5G technology. You're going to have a large attack surface. It's going to be big. It's going to be bloated in some cases. And sometimes people don't do the right thing. Yeah. But if the industry is not building those features into the products that you're using, and you still have a little bit of an architecture and integration problem, even if you're using commercial products, but that's the starting point. You can't expect anybody to be you know, building their own access control mechanisms that are two-factor authentication. That's not possible. Right. It's also part of my black box theory that if industry is not doing a good job of that, we got a black box that we're having, they're asking us to trust. Right. There's no assurance there, right? Yeah, exactly. How much assurance? That's, that's a whole other discussion. We have security functional requirements and security assurance requirements. Right. And hold that thought for the uh, the reason why that uh, we eliminated that uh, that self self assessment independent. Yeah, we'll assessment. get to that. We'll get to that here in a little bit. So, I've heard a lot you know, it, about that so far. It, yeah, I mean, it sort of gets to the same idea where if the criterion for tailoring is least cost, then you end up with a baseline that doesn't provide sufficient assurance. If the criterion for tailoring is to uh, make it, um, you know, cybersecurity configuration 101 ABC, then you probably won't end up with sufficient assurance for placing your CUI into exactly. the corresponding environment. It's, it's, it's the trade off situation. On, on that same yeah. note about sort of prerequisite security engineering knowledge, because this is derived from the 853 ecosystem context. Is there a certain level of familiarity with 853 that you would say somebody would need to know or have to to successfully work with what is contained in 171 and 172? It's certainly a benefit because everything in the 171 series is derivative from 853 and 53 alpha. So yes, obviously, if you're working in that space, everything you're going to see, especially in the revision three and moving forward, is going to look a lot more familiar uh, with what you've seen before. But having said that, that's still, you know, most of the people out there in the organizations may not have that luxury. It's just not in their lane to be experts at 53 or alpha. Sure. They're dealing with the same problem. So in that case, even if you're buying commercial products, which the vast majority of our industry partners who are dealing with CUI, they're, they're dealing with that with a commercial products base that they have purchased through the commercial marketplace. Even in that situation, though, it helps to have some knowledge about security architectures, because when you're bringing in these commercial products and you're trying to understand, I have CUI, it's gonna be moving around the organization, that brings in the flow control, access control, where is the CUI being stored, where is it moving? And that brings in this whole notion of security domains. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about having separate domains and protecting that domain and kind of isolating the problem space so you can do a better job of, of bringing those safeguards into play. If you can't do that, then maybe you're using a managed uh, service provider or managed security service provider. That's a whole other discussion too, because now that CUI, which you're responsible for in the private sector, who's really tethered back to a federal agency who really owns that CUI, now you've got a level of indirection. It came to you and you're using an MSP or an MSSP. Mm -hmm. That becomes a single point of failure potentially. And that's a place where the adversaries are really going to be honing in on. So yes, if you don't have the expertise to understand flow control, access control, INA, then you either have to hire the expertise. And if you're too small to do that, then maybe you have to find one of two solutions. Maybe you go out to a provider, but then you gotta make sure that provider knows what they're doing. And, yeah. and they've got some evidence to show you that. Or maybe you go back to your customer and say, hey, I need to have some infrastructure here, either on premises, so I can have that protection on site, or you can provide me a secure domain as part of right. your federal enclave, and I can work up there a little bit right. more safely. I'm just kind of giving you ideas. Sure. Of I, I think, and I think that makes total sense. I think the overall point, and one that we emphasize, is you know you can't NIST can't predict what those constraints will be, and so you no. can't tailor the baseline to the this the sort of least disruptive possible, it is up to the agreements between the agencies and their contractors to 
figure out how they're going to work the solution, not necessarily the tailoring decisions in the baseline directly. Otherwise, we'd end up with almost nothing in the baseline. Right. And you can you can see, uh, maybe we'll get into this later, about how, how we tailored, why we tailored. We brought in that new yeah. uh, tailoring category. There's a lot of rationale that went behind everything that we did. And I don't know if we have time to get into that, but we can talk about that later. Um, but you're right. There is overlap in the catalog. Our controls have always been overlapping. In a catalog this big, you find that different controls can can support um, different capabilities. Sometimes a single capability that you have to have multiple controls to implement that capability. And sometimes it goes the other way. Um, so there's a lot of technical uh, work that goes into analyzing the yeah. single controls, the interaction amongst the controls, the capability produced by the controls. And now we're doing this in an environment where we understand that you want to try to wring out that redundancy, if you can, in the 171, because we realize, we looked at all the public comments, but every single one of them, I think there were over 1,600 this time, yeah. and we see trend lines. We see now just because there's a trend line, there's a lot of chatter about a certain thing doesn't necessarily mean we're going to go one way because of that. We, we listen to the chatter, and if there's a way to resolve that problem that doesn't lower the, um, the strength of mechanism or the solution that we're trying to provide, then we're going to try to do that because, look, at, we understand this is one team, one fight. We're all in this together, even though it looks like, you know, with the, the programs and all the different things we're doing out there with CMMC and all the implementation, sometimes it gets messy because people have to implement all this stuff and, and be successful. And there's contracts writing on it. We sure. understand that. We're trying to get to that sweet spot where we can be we can stand up and say against the advanced persistent threat which is going to be 171 plus 172, or even if it's just 171 and you're not a high value asset or a critical target, you still want to be able to stand up and say, we've done our due diligence. We, we still may get hit, but nobody ever promised this would be, you know, attack free right. or breach free. Right. You yeah. Just, the, yeah. We haven't we haven't done uh, breach and and incident prevention as the single measurement of validity yeah. of standards in quite some time. So. Well, I guess, you know, that's that's a that overall summary up front of the overall perspective of the evolution is wonderful. Maybe now we can just jump into the, the understanding the changes at a high level. Sure. And we get into maybe some of the specifics. Right. So just changes at a at a sort of general level. We now have the uh, we have revision two of 800-171, which is currently out along with 800-171A. We have the initial public draft of 800-171 Rev 3. And we have the final public draft of 800-171 Rev3, along with the initial public draft of 171A Rev3. How should people think about the changes in those documents uh, at a high level currently? Uh, should people orient themselves from currently revision two to the final most recent drafts? Should they take all of them into consideration? Like what's the best method for beginning to sort this out? Uh, through well, the revision process. Two things are always true, especially in the documents that I've worked on over time. We always try to give our customers the greatest number of looks at a publication before it goes final. I feel we owe that to our customers to make sure we hear all of their concerns. We have a chance to act on those concerns where they need to be acted upon. And yet they don't have any surprises mm -hmm. at the end of the journey. So think of it as a wide cone. And as you get further down that timeline, the cone starts to narrow and narrow and narrow. Every draft, theoretically, and I, this is always, it's pretty much held for most of the publications I've worked on. Occasionally you get an outlier, but the number of public comments typically gets fewer and fewer as you go to the next iteration. Yeah. Why? Because people are or submit their comments, either they see that you acted on those or you didn't act on them. They either send the same comment again, try to give it a second bite at the apple, sure, sure. or they give up and they say, okay, this isn't going to do that for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, but that should be getting narrower and narrower. It's kind of like right now with 800-171 Rev3, uh, we're going to go through, we have the initial public draft. We now have the final public draft. Mm -hmm. The next iteration will be the final publication. Right Now, if my rule holds true, there should be no big surprises in the final publication. 
I equate this to being for all the pilots out there, you're on the final approach <laughs> to the runway. Yeah. That plane shouldn't be doing anything funny in that final approach. You are on a glide path. Every All systems are go. Maybe you're tweaking some things. You're putting up the rudders and you're adjusting things. But we don't want to see any major changes. Now, does that mean that there couldn't be a, a requirement pulled or one added? I would hope none that were added because that would be uh, additional consideration that we would like to hear from people on. But on occasion, we have pulled things out of control sets and, sure. and out of requirements where, where we think that we've heard the argument. It makes good common sense. It makes good technical sense. And so you could see things like that. The part of your other question, I always like to look at the first uh, draft. Now, we know where we're coming from. We're coming from Rev 2. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets back to your earlier question. Even with Rev 3, the vast majority of Rev 3 is still built on Rev 2. Right. There's a, there's a tremendous, and why is that? Because as you always state, it all goes back to the source document, 853. So it's not like we ripped out the entire infrastructure of 53 and put in something new. We did considerable tweaking. And, and we've talked about the two reasons, primary reasons are one, Rev 5 came out and we have to have it up to code with Rev 5 to do our due diligence in managing risk. And the second reason is, we're trying to ultimately reduce the number of documents and frameworks and controls and requirement sets we have out there. So we're going to be pulling that 171 requirement set back into a CUI overlay framework type of a, a scenario. Mm -hmm. This is why we're putting that CUI overlay out there now in the Rev3 so people can see what it starts to look like. Ultimately, what I think you're going to see is a 171 cover. And when you open it up, you're going to see a CUI overlay under that cover. And that's going to be more consistent presentation of those requirements now in the true control format. You know, as I said before, public and private sector, when it comes to protecting information and systems, we're largely using the same technology. So it's nice to have a language that has become kind of inculcated into the the society, all the professionals that are using this document, we're not the only show in town, right. but 53 is the one that the feds are using. A lot of the private sector is using. Some use ISO 27000. But until ISO has uh, the breadth and depth that we need, then we're probably going to have a separate you know, publication. Yeah. So, um, but that's the story. That's why we're really doing this stuff and everything. Yeah. And then that leads into why were the ODPs put in there? Well, because the ODPs actually, as you pointed out, appeared in 172. In the right. initial version. Yeah, you that get a really good preview of which way the 171 totally. was going to go because 172 was the first derivative document updated after 853 went to Rev 5. And it was exactly. a direct reflection of the new formatting and changes and and so and, on. I guess I guess on that in that sense though, you know, like we talked about uh a little earlier, as as you mentioned, one of the things that we hear very, very often in this revision process is people are hesitant to get started on their 171 implementation or to continue their 171 implementation for whatever reason that they're undertaking that project, because they think that uh, they should wait until the revision three uh, revision is final. And is, is that the right way to think about it? Is it is it that the revision three will invalidate their work on 171 revision two? Is, is, the, is waiting for the revision a blocker from them to continue their monitoring or their or their overhauls or their upgrades or getting started at all? Well, obviously we don't have any control over what the private sector does. That's done by the individual contracts that sure. are being let for CUI. But if you're asking my personal opinion, I even if CMMC and FISMA never existed, if you are operating in the 21st century and you've got intellectual property, personal health information, any type of critical information that you are processing, storing, or transmitting, even if FISMA didn't exist or CMMC didn't exist, you would still want to protect that critical data. It's critical to you. It may not be critical to anybody else, but it's critical to your business operation. Mm -hmm. If you have a cyber attack and somebody steals some of your intellectual property, even if it's never going to DOD or the IC or anything like that, they could bring your business down to its knees in one cyber attack today. That's the thing that's really, it's interesting and frustrating about the whole world of, of cyber warfare. And we're dealing with computers. Kinetic attacks are very visible. 
Cyber attacks are totally invisible to most people. They can't see them. Sometimes they don't even know they're under attack while they're under attack until the damage is actually done and the adversary is long gone. The barn door is open. The horses are out of the barn. So I always recommend that people start their security programs, no matter whether you're working for the federal contracts world or whether you're just trying to protect your business. And to your question, there may be a few things in Rev2 that you may not need to do anymore, but maybe they got incorporated in other requirements. Sometimes we we withdraw many requirements. It looks like they're gone, but as you said before, they're really not totally gone. They're incorporated right. into other controls and requirements. We do that a lot of times for uh, ease of use for our customers so they can see like requirements or like controls in the same lane, so to speak. Right, right. That way it's, so, it's a little less like reading a dictionary and more like... Yeah, the controls uh, and the enhancement grow organically. If you roll the clock back to the initial 853, we're going back to 2005. Oh, yeah. So we've grown this catalog over the years, and sometimes new enhancements come in because of a cyber attack or something we discover, and they just get piled onto the next number sequence in that family. And then when you go back years later, this is why I was talking about we have a fair amount of redundancy built in. And that's not always bad. That means that sometimes a controller enhancement to achieve a capability can also be achieved through a different control or maybe a combination of the two controls. And yes, you would like to ring out all redundancy so everything operates in its nice little lane. But it's kind of like in the military, we have overlapping fields of fire. If I started out in the infantry, and when you're in a foxhole, you're sitting there next to another guy, and, and you're interlocking fields of fire, make sure that nothing gets through. So there, hit, there has been some redundancy over the years. I don't think it's harmful, and sometimes organizations that tailor controls out will address that redundancy on their own. They decide that, hey, we can do this by X, Y, and Z. We're going to tailor this one out. I'm, I'm, def I'm describing my rationale for that so the IG doesn't come in and beat me over the head. But nonetheless, they're doing that. So this is what led to one of our new tailoring categories called other related controls. Mm -hmm. You'll probably notice that when you look at the, the tailoring uh, categories in Appendix C, I think it is now, in the latest draft, some of those changed. We have the NFO problem, which I think is historical by now. Everybody, yeah. if you don't know what so the NFO, we definitely problem, have some more, some more, some more. I have some detailed questions about about those tailoring decisions on NFO. Well, there. I'll just give you the I'll give you the overview, and then whatever I yeah. miss, you can you can jump okay. in. But the NFO, let's start with the NFO. So that was part of that original tailoring I talked about, where we got rid of everything that wasn't related to unauthorized disclosure. We got rid of all federal stuff, and we we got rid of controls that were. Um, we, we called them NFOs. And what that meant was, it was my same uh, assumption. This was back in 2014. We could put everything in the moderate baseline in there, but yeah. do we really want to do that? Let, let's try to give our customers the benefit of the doubt. And let's, let's, let's assume that if you're operating a business in the 21st century and you have anything you want to protect, that you are going to probably have some kind of a security program or some kind of safeguards or countermeasures that you put into a place. It may not be two-factor authentication, but we're assuming you're using passwords, you're using, you're doing inventories of stuff, you are, you are probably um, maybe have a security plan, some of the basics that you would, you would think, uh, you'd like to think that people were doing. Well, that eliminated from the 171 requirements a whole bunch of things that were right. categorized out as NFOs. Now, this was a mistake for several reasons. Number one, the assumption turned out to be not so good. Yeah. <laughs> I won't use the fact that it was wrong, but let's just say that it wasn't as good an assumption as we thought it would be. Sure. So that that and but look, at, that's the way you learn. You know, we we have this ongoing relationship with our right. customers. It's an iterative yeah. process. I mean, this is the way the process is supposed to work, right? This is the way the process works. So we discovered that. The other thing, the unintended consequence of that decision was it left the implementers, whether it was the DOD or whether it was a federal agency. Now, when they go out to their contract, they put out the 171 requirements, which are the explicit requirements in the document. And then there's all these NFOs. And so now they're left with a decision, uh, you know, on the non-federal perspective side, 
Right. Those folks are saying, well, those are NFOs. They're, they're, they're not part of my contract, but mm -hmm. in the NIST guidance document said we expect that these would be implemented yeah. or satisfied. Yeah. So now it kind of puts you in that gray zone. It's, it's not a zone you want to be in. When you're in the cybersecurity business, whether you're accepting risks that are explicit, that are on your radar, that you're actually, you understand the risk and you accept it. That's the big thing about risk management. A lot of folks manage risk without understanding what the risks really are. They make bad risk-based decisions. Understanding was job one. So for that reason, we felt that as we moved to Rev3, and we also are moving back now toward that CUI overlay, there are no NFOs in the world of 53. So we decided that we were going to try to eliminate as many as we could in that first initial public draft. And we did. Um, some of those were that we rethought the requirements. Some went directly to CUI, which means, okay, we told you before that you probably should have been doing this, and now we're really telling you that it's going to be in the requirements set. It's there. It's right. categorized to CUI. But also we looked at some of these things, and again, we're looking at so maybe that we interpret that to mean um, it could be the NCO category, which means if you take a really hard look at this particular uh, control or the requirement, Maybe there's an argument to me where it's not really directly related to protecting unauthorized disclosure. You'll see some of that going from the NFO to the NCO category. Again, right. we're trying to look at this from our non-federal customers' perspectives, and we're taking a hard look at all of these things. Then we did find some redundancy. Now, this is the great part of why I love the public review periods and the comments, because our customers, not just you know, on the federal side, through industry, through academia, in the United States, all around the world, you would be amazed at the number of people's eyeballs that are on this document from around the world for lots of different reasons. They are pointing out where, hey, you ask us to do this requirement and three levels, you know, three requirements down, there's the same, there's another requirement, but it you know, largely does the same thing. So yeah. we, we looked at all those comments and we went back and through excruciating detail, we tried to map out what controls actually had that kind of redundancy within the catalog. Right. And, we, and then we asked the important question, if I eliminate that requirement and I either incorporate that into another requirement or I just make it an ORC where I'm now making a statement that if you implemented the other requirement, the original one uh, that was overlapping, we feel this gives you adequate coverage for closing down that specific vulnerability or that gap. Now, you can argue over these things endlessly because there is a there's subjectivity and there's objectivity. There's technical correctness. And then there's a big gray area, which you could argue with. And the gray area has always been in 53 because we have that built in redundancy. So when you look at what moved to ORC, we are, we are stating that we see enough coverage in other requirements to do the job. Now, that's going to be subject to this next review. And when you're out there and you're looking at, as you stated before, if you want to have the most impact on what NIST does, go to the categorizations of what we have done. Yep. In you got to read Appendix C, people. That's where you that read Appendix C. the way that I phrase this in the non-federal perspective for folks is, you know, NIST very clearly and understandably says we won't tailor things based off of cost. We tailor this right. set of moderate baseline controls based off of CUI confidentiality. And those tailoring decisions are documented in Appendix E currently, Appendix C in Rev3, so on and so forth. So if you want to affect size and cost indirectly, then you should address the tailoring decisions to say this should come in or out. And then everybody wins because we get closer to the standard that everybody would agree on through multiple lenses. Now, we've got some specific questions about tailoring that we'll get to in a little while. But I guess just to, to, to summarize here, the what I hear from all of this so far is the decisions that are contained in the drafts and the revision process are not arbitrary. Uh, they are informed by risk. They're informed by public comment. It's this iterative process. It's a very robust process that now spans over a, a year, pretty much. So right. would you characterize, just to sort of put a button on this section, would you would you characterize revision three, once it becomes final, as better than revision two? Like, is it objectively better? You know, How should you 
evaluate revision two to revision three once it finally comes out? I like it a lot more than revision two for, for several reasons. Number one, I think it solves the problem of everybody loves generalized high-level requirements. Everyone loves generalized high-level frameworks. Why? Because lots of different solutions can work and you don't get pinned down or you don't... It's like everything in the world when you're going to build something, it starts out with a high level requirement and you end up going through multiple layers of requirements engineering. And those requirements get more specific as you get down to the design and implementation. So you have the same thing with any kind of a framework, whether it's a cybersecurity framework, even the RMF, it operates at 30,000 feet. But at some point through the controls and requirements, you're getting down closer to ground zero where the implementation takes place. Now, the problem with 171 Rev 2 is that people like it because they were very general requirements, outcome-based. They were pretty much um, didn't have a lot of meat on it like you would see in the bones of 853. So that was a plus for some and a minus for others. Certainly, it was difficult for the implementers because you have a lot of different ways you can go, which, which could be an advantage, but it really was detrimental to the assessors because they didn't have enough information to really do a, a quality assessment. So for all the right reasons, and that's part of the movement back to the 853 structure and terminology is that you get more detail. That's also the reason why the ODPs made their appearance because number one, they are a central part of 853. And that ODP construct, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a very powerful concept because it allows a requirements or a control developer like NIST to have some degree of specificity, but also introduce a level of flexibility that's needed to do the job. Right. And again, I know my favorite example is from the CP family. It might be CP9. It's doing system backups. Yep. Thou shalt do system backups. How often do you do them? Well, that totally depends on your mission in the organization. I can give you examples where some of our federal uh, partners, agencies, are doing hourly backups because the mission is so critical and that data has to be backed up that often. Other ones, maybe weekly, maybe monthly. And if you and hard coded it into the requirements directly, then it would either be way too much for some folks, it would be way too little yes. for other folks. And then people would criticize the standard as being out of touch as soon as it's published. You sort of have to have those variables coded. And in. by the I way, think. if you go back and look at the early uh, 853 documents, the early controls did have hardwired parameters in there. We didn't have the ODPs till later, yep. the variables. Some of that comes from computer science. If you've ever been a programmer, you know that concept of variables is kind of a computer science thing. But it's very helpful. So now we introduced o ODPs in, in the 53 document to a big, big extent. And, and now the, the, the downside is, is that it forces the federal agency or, or the, 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 the organization that is using those controls. One of their jobs is to complete the variable. And right. once that, that variable of, is just yes, to jump in, it's part of the tailoring process. Technically, it's according part of the tailoring to the process. Degree, the tailoring process is not complete until those ODPs are defined. So yes. 171, as it exists right now, in my reading, is an initial baseline to use the parlance of 853. Uh, we need those ODPs to be defined for it to be a fully tailored uh, baseline. This is something that we really went into detail on our longer conversation back in May, which we'll link right. to. Uh, below. That way people can really dive into the details of the ODPs if they're curious. And we'll have some specific questions about ODPs and their changes in the in the current draft uh, later on. Now, you know, the thing about ODPs is, so <clears throat> once you instantiate that variable, it becomes part of the requirement or part of the control. And that's what you're going to be assessed against. And any federal agency that is using 53 now with ODPs and that's going out under contract for CUI on the federal side, let's say they're currently they could be doing this in any federal agency now with, with CUI. It's imperative that they define the ODPs that they care about. Now, this is what's leading to the eventual resolution. We got a ton, 2,000 pounds worth of comments, a ton of comments on ODPs. Yep. Surprisingly, some people liked them and, and a lot of people didn't like them. But some of the people that uh, weighed in said, 
I don't know who's going to do that. You know, is that up to me as the non-federal entity or is right. it up to the federal? Who is the mysterious, uh, who's the mysterious, mysterious person known as the organization? Who is the exactly. shadowy cabal? <laughs> so now NIST is left with a, a couple of options. You can take the ODPs out altogether, but now you can't get back to 53 because that that doesn't give you a glide path back to the CUI overlay. And right. it also is not consistent with how we want to do business with the 172, which has now set that precedent. We want that can be consistent across all the requirements. But the other thing is that it absolutely micromanages the requirements and the control process. Because as we were talking about, um, even in the CMMC case, with where the DOD is the primary driver of the agency that's, that's going to be managing that program, they're going to have to, I would think they would be one of the first ones to argue they need to have some specificity where it needs to be there. Now, right. one of the things you noticed um, in the crypto requirement where we had the hardwiring of the FIPS validated crypto, you see now that's been reframed right. as an ODP, which gives the federal agencies a little flexibility. And, and here's where that's going to be critical. Let's say that there's a, a vulnerability discovered in a validated crypto module, and then now there's a patch been issued for that. Theoretically, you've got two choices. You can put the patch in, and maybe that takes it out of the validated mode, if you will, because it hasn't gone back through the process. Is that better to do that or to leave that vulnerability and use the old unpatched version of that uh, crypto module? You see, these are the kinds of real-world decisions that – we could make those, but it would not be in our best interest to do so. We have to be able to let the customer, the federal agency, make those kind of calls when they feel it's appropriate within their risk tolerance. Sure. Now, as it turned out, there were a lot of ODPs in there. I think um, I think you guys maybe are, are do the best job of counting everything. Uh, I, I was I'm surprised how many people count stuff, but they do, and that's okay. But <clears throat> we got rid of over half the ODPs. Yeah. Now. How do we do that? It wasn't just wave our hand over them and they go away. Some of the ODPs went away because we, we tried to analyze, is this ODP absolutely essential to, in other words, is that flexibility needed to make the right decision and have the right technical outcome? Sometimes it was not. And that's where you see we put back in some words which some would argue were very ambiguous. Like you, you, you see the emergence of a word that came out a long time ago in 53 called periodically. Yeah, this is one of the specific questions I had on, on ODPs. I here. Be all over that one. Well, periodically came out before because we had OD, we had unlimited use of our ODP credit card in 53. <laughs> we could put those in wherever we wanted to. So one of my hot buttons was we, we tried to eliminate ambiguity where we could. Well, but so I guess, I guess, I guess I'll just, yeah. I'll just, if you, if you'll, if you'll, uh, indulge me here for a moment. We'll sure. just sort of read ahead. What is the actual practical difference between saying an organizationally defined frequency or time period and saying periodically? One is easier to read. It's more efficient to to read and to and to understand. But isn't it? Aren't you just doing the same thing? Aren't you defining something in some period versus an organizationally defined frequency? Aren't aren't we saying two things? You know, saying the same thing two different ways? Well, it depends. <laughs> that, that, there's actually three answers to your question. One, <laughs> if the organization defined parameter appears as an ODP where you're required to instantiate, then it's not the same at all because that means you're required to put some value in there. There's no, there's no guessing about what that is going to be. Someone's going to have to take the responsibility of defining that parameter. Now, if the words organization defined appear in the text, not as an ODP, I think you might see some of that. Mm -hmm. just the terminology, then yes, that really, there's a slight difference between that and the word periodically, because periodically is kind of, it leaves it up to the imagination. Periodically can be in the eye of the beholder, sure. whereas organization defined, whether it's instantiated as part of an official ODP or whether we just put the words in there expressed as plain text, if you will, mm -hmm. then there's going to be an expectation on the part of the assessors that hey, the organization is supposed to define something. Now, that's where you get into the 53 alpha and the 171 alpha. That's where the rubber, when you pop the hood of 171, you just see an engine there. But when you right. start taking the engine apart, you see every part. And with every part, 
there's a whole bunch of stuff under there in 171 Alpha that the assessor's going to be looking at. It's part right. of the parts manual. You don't really see that when you're looking at 171. I think that's, that's one of the part, points you know, you're making. Like I, like I like to stress to people, that's the part that your internal and external assessor should be looking at. I mean, these are the same questions that a business owner would want to ask to know, is what I'm spending my money on and people right. spending time on actually doing anything? The nice part, in my opinion, of 53A and 171A is it, it normalizes the questions to get to the same answer, whether it's internal verification or external, which is sort of unique in the, the landscape of various standards and guidelines and so on and so forth. So when you look at 171, would I like to see periodically taken out and have ODPs? Sure, you get more specificity. But in every case where you see periodically, the thought process that we used at NIST was to say, if we don't use an ODP there and just periodically, what's the worst thing that could happen in this case? Does it really affect the unauthorized disclosure of CUI? We came to the conclusion this is one of those cases where we could we could provide a, a little wiggle room for the ambiguity that's there. Now, it's not going to, once this moves back to a full CUI overlay, that ambiguity may go away as we start to move. And I know that timing has not been announced yet. It won't be in Rev 3. It may not mm -hmm. be Rev 4. But someday we'll get back to that pure C, CUI over. But now we're on a journey. And we're not going back to the CUI overlay all in one fell swoop. So, yes, there are periodically that word is in there. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the ODPs that remain, those are the ones that we felt um, can have an effect on the actual technical implementation of the requirements. So the feds, the highest level, whoever your sponsoring agency is for that contract or that agreement, that organization always has the first right of refusal to instantiate or define every ODP they think are important. Right, because they're the and data owner, so... Yes. If they don't define it, they can pass it downstream. So let's say there was only, let's say the DOD only had one one ODP they cared about. And that was the crypto one with the FIPS mm -hmm. and all that. And they just defined that one. Everything else got passed downstream. That means everybody basically is on their own to define it. And that doesn't mean that they can shirk the responsibility. That, that means that the non-federal organization must define a value for the ODP. And that's a good thing because when the assessors come in, and you brought up an important point, Cost effectiveness does come in. If you're backing up your system every hour, that's more expensive than doing it once a week or once a month. Right. How much you do the backups is going to depend on your mission and how important your senior leader, the CEO, or whoever's in the in the middle of that chain feels that that control need to be needs to be implemented. What, what's the level of rigor or or effectiveness for that particular variable that you might instantiate? So. One of the things that we're trying to do, and again, this isn't a NIST direct responsibility, but as part of the federal government, we're concerned about the questions we got. Who does the instantiation? Well, mm -hmm. that, that's still an open question, but there, there are at least discussions going on now amongst some various federal entities about who should do that and yeah. how much that's should great. they do. That's great. And, I mean, this is something I've pointed out about the ODPs as well is, you know, the move back to 853, the move back to that formatting, the introduction of the ODPs explicitly in the formatting has caused those questions to be asked and has sort of right. initiated or catalyzed the move towards, you know, what's the policy going to be towards ODPs? Which ones do the, does the government really care about? Which ones are contractors available to define? And I know Jason's been, you know, sitting on this question the whole time here, uh, you know, about that, about that bigger timeline. So yeah, like I, I definitely have a couple questions about uh, about the timelines uh, to, to go over with Dr. Ross. And so first, I, I, you kind of touched on it uh, briefly, saying that um, you're not exactly sure where revision three fits in the overall transition of 171 to an 853 overlay, like fully reflective of 853. Like, do you have somewhat of an idea? Like, we're halfway there, we're three quarters of the way there, or? Well, I would say that. Again, without trying to get the crystal ball out too much here, one thing we can say is we, we've committed to the transition of moving those high-level requirements in Rev 2 back to a structure that looks more like 853. I would say that with, with the final version of 8 171 Rev 3, we are 
probably three quarters of the way down that road now. In other words, once those get inculcated into the ecosystem, I, I wouldn't think it'd be a heavy lift in Rev4. And I'm, I won't say when Rev4 will be. You know, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that every time we do an update, and we understand this very well, there's a huge ripple effect downstream, probably more so with 171 than most of the other publications because of the focus of the CMMC and the DIB and the DFARs and the FAR, to be honest. That, that's not just a DFAR. It's a, it's a FAR problem. Absolutely. So sure. we are trying to be sensitive to the fact that this journey, it it has to go on. We want it to be done with respect to our customers. We don't want to have to, you know, anything, any sh sudden shifts. But I do believe that as Rev3 gets inculcated into the ecosystem, people get comfortable with it. It becomes part of the landscape. That next small jump will not be that far yeah. after that. So okay. what I can't tell you is how long we're going to sit on Rev3. Sure. You know, one of the we, things we are on a we are on a longer geologic timeline here, though, towards the return to a overlay. Right. What you're saying. But, yep. One thing I'll tell you though is, is that look at 53 and 53 alpha. If you want to get your crystal ball out and see what it's going to look like in 171 down the road. <laughs> You, you can, we are heavily moving and committing to automated processes, automated content. So I can't tell you when this will happen, but someday, if you look at what's happened to 53 and 53 Alpha with the CPRT and other publications, our expectation is that someday that's what you're going to see with 171. Now, it may turn out that that, that won't happen fully, that full C, uh, CPRT implementation until we move to the overlay. Then it'll be pretty easy. Yeah. Because everything that already is prepositioned with right. the language and the structure of 53, and then the assessment procedures in Alpha would follow that. So it's it's a kind of a semi painful transformation, but long term automation, having everything searchable, is the way you mm -hmm. want to go. And more important, having the flexibility, the agility to bring new content into those safeguard the world of safeguards with an adversary that is ruthless and does not wait for the next update, this is going to be a critical part of any new capability that we deliver to our customers. So we're going to try to do it in the best way we can. There will be bumps along the road. That's going to be, I can assure you that. Um, none of this stuff is easy. Um, so let's, what, um, let's, let's shift a little bit and talk about timelines that are more immediate or, or that are more clear of a picture for you. Um, first and foremost being the, uh, the revision process for 171, right? right? Right now, we're in a revision process that spans pretty much more over a year for 171 um, with multiple drafts and multiple comment periods. What is the timeline for final revisions? So I would say um, that uh, we've, we've said publicly now that we're going to have the 171 Rev3 final out in the spring. Now, I, I always use I don't want to be too clever. I, I use spring because it could be anywhere from <laughs> Big March <window. laughs> to June 21st. But right. if you were if you were really um, trying to narrow us down on that three month period, I would expect it to be closer to the start of spring than to the start of summer. Um, there, there'll be some caveats to that, and I, like I said before, our the speed of that document getting to final is still going to depend on how many comments we get, what kind of comments we get, and how long it takes us to resolve those comments. Now, sure. the reason why we're, and, and by the way, the 171 alpha is now tethered to the 171. Which is, right. thank you very much for doing that, by the way. Thank you very, very well, much for doing this. And the reason we can do that is it's not the same type of a development process. Once you agree on what the content of 171 is, we go through there and it's like a surgical operation. We go in and we slice up those requirements, which are sourced back to the 53 controls. We go right to 53 alpha. And that's the way I start the process. I load it up with 53 alpha and I snip and I trim until the alpha looks like the 171, which is really a tailored version of 53. Right. So we're, we're kind of, we're trying that that that's why it's easier for us to deliver that. Now it means you got to work in parallel on some sure. of this stuff. We, 
I was working on 171R3 at the same time I'm doing 50, uh, 171 Alpha. It's kind of like two screens going back and forth, but there's some advantage to that because you're seeing many times we found um, a problem with, with 171 Alpha that we had drafted um, and we had a correction in 171 and vice versa. These two documents play off each other. So you can count on the fact that the next time you see 171R3, whether it's anywhere from March 21st to June 21st, you're going to see both documents in final, and they will both be revision three. And for those of you who've been asking, what happened to revision one and revision two of, of, of 171 Alpha? They never existed. Yeah, it'll be we, a fun. We, uh, it'll be a fun uh, wild goose chase to send new analysts. Yes, be like, go find a so, copy of uh, 171A Rev two for me. <laughs> and kind of just to clarify on, on that timeline, uh, Dr. Ross, we're at the final public draft of um, 171, and this is the initial public draft of 171A, but these right. are the final iterations of drafts before it goes final, correct? Yes, correct. Final iterations. And so the next time you see 171 alpha, it'll go from initial to final. And again, okay. normally we wouldn't do that, but we have a high degree of confidence that Anything we're doing to 171 Alpha is going to be directly related to what changes were made in 171 R3. So there's really no need to string this out. We used to take a year to get 53 Alpha out, and we used to get hammered by everybody. In fact, we even had some people go to OMB one time and say, we can't do this iteration of 53 until you give us the assessment guidelines. And we said, well, that's not really true. It'd be nice to have the guidelines. Um, sure. Uh, that document, uh, when, when you print it out hard copy, and I know Jacob knows this because he gives them away as Christmas gifts yeah, or Halloween yeah. gifts, uh, it's enormous. And one time, you know, we, we get a lot of people who always come to say, hey, 53 is too big. 53 alpha is even bigger. It's just too much. And I say, okay, I give them a blank sheet of paper. I say, what do you want me to take out of 53? Yeah. Want me to take a, out? That's a great I even, that's a, I even threaten one time to – Sunset 53 Alpha because people were complaining about the size and and I got a huge pushback on that. Nobody wants to really. They everyone likes to complain about the size of the document, but in reality, it's a bunch of baselines you can tailor, yeah. and you want you want the richness and the diversity of that catalog to be broad and deep, so you can find stuff in the parts bin to build a Corvette if you need to build a Corvette. If you don't need to build a Corvette, then that parts bin don't go there. Right. But yeah. So so your your question yes. Next time you see both those documents, they will be final. And then what's going on with the 172? Um, Great I put, question. Yeah, I put this in my LinkedIn thing. And this is, by, by the way, um, we can never we never post anything in social media that has not been officially discussed sure. in open through a forum. We're not, allowed to, we're not allowed to do that. But I love Excellent. social media. And I try to use it as much as I can because to me, it gives us a personal relationship with our customers. And I listen a lot to what's going on in social media because I love the dialogue. I love the issues that are brought up. It gives me new ideas. It gives me second thoughts sometimes about how we can do things better. And I think tapping into that great resource out there is phenomenal. That doesn't ever substitute for the public comment process, but I do like to share things. And one of the things I'm using social media for now is to educate on some key issues. I've written a lot of articles on LinkedIn. Most people have never read them. They're all there in LinkedIn. We'll link to them. Here, I'm going to put this down. We're going to put these in the show notes. Go read they Ron's articles, everybody. Yeah, two or three years. And this, I started getting on my high horse about how security engineering was never talked about. And we, we were too focused on frameworks and controls. And the real problem was engineering. But you're going to see more and more post like last night where I talk about 172. Now, the takeaway from last night is when did 172 start? It started last Thursday. As soon as we published the the, the draft, the final draft of 171. And the, the, we're working on things in parallel now. So um, I'm going to be going out and reaching out, whether it'll be a call for comments officially or whether just going to the different agencies 172 has a set of requirements in it now. There's probably 30 or so. I don't know the exact number. Um, I think some of those made it into the level three of the DOD's new CMMC program. I think maybe 24 made it into that. Yep. Again, 
that was a tailoring decision by the DOD. We had discussions back and forth about should NIST only put in the ones the DOD felt were going to be needed by the CMMC program? We said, no, we have to look at across all of our customers. And many of those customers are not going to be just dealing with CUI in the CMMC program. We have customers that are across the entire intelligence community, the Sweet 16 Intel agencies and all the DOD and all the federal agencies. And they need to have a set of enhanced security requirements that may or may not be needed for their specific mission. The, the, the DOD is going to make that decision, and they did. And the same way they'll probably end up making some decisions about the ODPs, they have the ability to do that like all customers do. But that work has begun in earnest now, and it's being guided and informed by two things. What kinds of cyber attacks have we seen, experienced, not just in the public sector, but the private sector. And what do we anticipate our adversaries, especially the APT, are going to be throwing at us in the future? And so you may see the requirements grow in 172. And again, I, I would caution everyone, don't keep counting stuff. Just take the stuff that you need. Don't count all the parts in the parts bin because you're going to be overwhelmed, hopefully not disappointed, but you're never going to need everything in that parts bin mm -hmm. if you're doing the right Absolutely. job. As someone who but, makes a hobby of counting things in 853, um, yeah. if it's and, not and, a hobby, don't don't start. <laughs> and, and by the way, the same um, philosophy will hold with 172 Alpha. Again, as, as we're building 172, simultaneously we're going to be rolling out in-house in within NIST those assessment procedures that are going to go with those requirements. So when you see the initial public draft of one, now this is where it may differ a little bit. You didn't see the assessment guidelines until um, you didn't see them with the IPD. Right. It, it, you didn't see it. Yeah. Yes. Now, well, I hate to, I don't want to commit to anything because I, I sometimes I have to go back on my word. But sure. Well, we have very broad. I remember I remember prior to the pre-draft comments, I heard you on a podcast say, you know, over the course of like 18 months ish, we're going to update the CUI series. Is this is this 172 revision, you know, something that you see being a year ish, two years ish, or is it going to be faster than that? I would, without committing, I would sure. like to see all of this stuff wrapped up by the end of calendar year 2024, yeah. if possible. Well, and, now, and doing them in sequence with 172 and 172A, you know, that seems, yes. that seems so to if we're on track, achievable. So. If we're on track with 171 and 171 Alpha and we're legitimately done by the spring, hopefully earlier than later, and the 172 process, we're starting to pick up some clock cycles on that while the 60 day public comments out there, while you guys are out there commenting on stuff, we don't just pack up and go watch, uh, you know, ESPN and all that. We're, right. we're working on the next round. And so we'll be busily working on 172. So I don't know if it's prudent for us to put out the 171, 172 alpha with the initial public draft of 172. Mm -hmm. I would almost rather people focus on the requirements for that initial round and then when we go to the final for the 172, we then put out the assessment. The same thing we did with 171. Sure. Because I don't want people to get distracted on the assessment procedures and, and forget and, and lose focus on the actual requirements. So I can see, it, the, it, I can see the validity yeah. of doing just 172 and then in the, in the subsequent draft do 172 and 172A. I think there's trade-offs to both. But, um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, I think there's probably... There's probably trade-offs to both. I think there's advantages and uh, and disadvantages, but that's great information. But the one thing I guarantee, though, is you will see 172 and 172 alpha come out final at the same time, just right. like the 171 paradigm. Same. That's same such same. a great. Yeah, it's been such a great change, and I think yeah, that's again very. We're very very grateful that you guys and, and your team are are doing that. So uh, I know Absolutely. Jason had some stuff on 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 the public comments specifically that we wanted to jump into here. Yeah, so Dr. Ross, um, uh, the public comment period is designed to last until January 12th of this year, like you've already stated, and uh, your team reads hundreds, thousands of comments. What have you learned as NIST so far through this revision process? Well, the revision process, this is why I love 
working at NIST and lo I love the, the process that we go through. It's sometimes, uh, it's like making sausage, you know, it's sometimes it's got speed bumps here and there, but you learn an enormous amount of what's going on in the real world with everything that we put out in that public draft. For example, in the initial public draft, there was a lot of stuff. We were, we were, we were asking people to absorb a lot of change in that transition we proposed. And we heard a lot. We, we look for trend lines. And this is what's so interesting. Sometimes you get a one-off comment that is brilliant, that nobody else thought of. And we take that one comment and there may be a change that comes out of that one comment. Other times there could be a lot of comments that are in a particular trend line that we can't do much about. I would categorize the cost issue that we, we hear a lot of people talk about. That's something we, we can feel your pain, but we can't do anything about that because if you ask us to lower the bar for requirements and technical correctness, then that's not going to fit our mold of what our responsibilities are. Sure. But in the case of the grab, we heard about the ODPs loud and clear. People brought out a lot of great issues. For example, somebody needs to define those at the federal level or a group that the feds in general want to weigh in on. Why is that important? Well, if every federal latency weighs in differently on those ODPs, then you've got companies out there that serve more than one contractor, more than one federal agency. And they're going to be trying to do three or four different instantiations of ODPs, you know, for three different contracts. So again, we hear a lot of issues here that NIST cannot directly solve, but by hearing them, we can take them back to the right form and we can energize that. And that's what we're doing now with the, with the ODPs, trying to at least present the issue and then have the right parties start to work on solutions. Gotcha. So we heard about the ODPs. We heard a lot about cost. We heard a lot about some redundancy of requirements and all of that. Um, but again, all of that is useful information. And, you know, we talk about our team. Our, <laughs> some people think that our team is enormous. We have the actual primary authors on, on this version of 171 or two. <laughs> it's like myself and, and Vicky Pilateri. And then we have a tremendous um, small a very competent team that uh, does a lot of the, um, I call it quality control checking. They're very familiar with our FISMA team, our experts in the controls and the assessment procedures. So they can, they can look at the stuff coming out in 171 ahead of when it goes public and they can take it through its pay. It's like a murder board. You know, you're going through a dissertation sure. defense. Um, so we have that. And then we have a whole group of tech editors and, you know, people that are doing all of this documents, not just ours. And we, we want to strive to put out, the best quality product that we can, a product that is easily consumed, even though it's a very technically challenging topic and set of topics, and that's not always easy to do. Uh, but that's kind of how the, the common process works. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. You have to have a thick skin because uh, people can say some stuff in comments and you have to always divorce yourself from, you almost have to look at every comment as being constructive because people are coming at this from their perspective. Right. You know, we don't look at the world from a federal perspective. We look at things one way. They're coming at this from a non-federal perspective. They're coming at it from academia or industry, a small company, a mid-sized company, a Fortune 500 company. And so you have to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And we try to understand why did they submit the comment if it's in our scope? What can we learn from the comment? And does the comment... It, does it precipitate some kind of a change? And sometimes it takes more than one individual with one request for a change before that change is made. Because sometimes when you make one change, there's a, um, a cascading effect. And that one change that solves one person's problem can introduce other problems downstream for other people by that change. So yeah, you can see it's a really complicated process, but the public comments that we get, um, and the, the I call it the sunshine on the documents process. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Alrighty, so we covered a bunch of the overview of the uh, changes in the drafts, the evolution of the drafts, what's coming in the drafts, as well as some of the high level changes and how to think about ODPs and and categorization decisions. I had some some specific questions uh, for you about some of the changes in uh, in the drafts. If you would humor me as we go through these, so. The tailoring process that we talked about earlier, this categorization process of controls in the moderate baseline has to get put into these various buckets. 
not related to confidentiality. They are related to CUI confidentiality. They're fed, so on and so forth. You know, as these tailoring categories have changed, you know, how does NIST actually decide that something is or is not related to the confidentiality of of CUI? For for example, I wish the <clears throat> process were cut and dry, but actually, you you have to go back and uh, try to understand the. The, the control, the source control, the requirement, what it's actually trying to do with regard to protecting CUI from an authorized disclosure. So, for example, we talked earlier about the technical underpinnings of these protection mechanisms. For example, access control. At the mechanism level, that access control policy, whether it's enforcing unauthorized disclosure, unauthorized modification, it's an access control problem. So the same mechanisms are in place. If, you don't, if, if you're not uh, fortunate enough to have a, a technical basis to make that decision on, then you just have to go back and look at, you play it through. If this control was removed from the CUI status and was reassigned as NCO, if we have a cyber attack, is this control, the lack of this control or requirement, would that be contributing to the to the success of that attack? Mm -hmm. Or could you make an argument that we have other things surrounding those requirements and controls that would mitigate that possibility? Gotcha. So it's not a not a cut and dry type of a process. Right. There is some judgment. Now there there are if we're gonna get into down the road, I think you you might be interested in and I know a lot of people have asked about the one requirement that required independent assessment. Right. And now there there was a totally different rationale for that. And I can go into that now or you can wait till No, no, I think that I think that's probably hot on people's minds. Uh, I definitely would love to know more about the rationale behind. So for those not familiar who are who are uh, just now tuning in, so independent assessments were not a requirement in 800-171 Rev 2. They appeared tailored in the initial draft of 800-171 Rev 3. And now they are taken out of the final draft of Rev 3. So just for that context. It was very interesting because that independent assessment control is definitely in the moderate baseline. So there was every justification to bring that forward into the requirements. And as you would expect, the reaction was quite substantive, if you will. There was a lot of reaction to that. And it was pretty much split into two camps. I think if you're an assessor and you're running a business out there that provides independent third-party assessments, sure. I think you're going to be on the cheerleading squad for that one. Of course. On the other hand, it scared a lot of organizations because they automatically assume they have to go out outside of the organization to get that third-party independent assessment. And again, Jacob, to your point, when you go back and read the controls in 53, you will see that the, the independent assessment is explained in the discussion section. So independence does not automatically mean you have to go outside the organization to get that capability. You can do it within the organization as long as there is an independence of people or groups doing that assessment. Right. Um, that's, that's done actually quite frequently. Now, if, uh, if an organization is sufficiently small enough, though, then that level of independence may not exist internally. So I know that we don't always use size of an organization as a tailoring criteria, but this seems like a little bit of a concession here, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, whether it was in or whether it was out. So it's not that it's not that that is never a consideration, right? Right. Well, that's what you would that's what you would think, especially if you're a two person organization and you look over at me and say, OK, I'm doing this and you're the only other person, so you become the independent assessor. Um, in reality, there was actually a, a reason uh, for moving that back out of the catalog. It has to do with the concept, and, and again, this gets back to kind of foundational cybersecurity and computer security. Security controls and security requirements come in two flavors. There are functional security requirements, and there are security assurance requirements. Right. There are certain controls that are functional in nature. And there are certain controls that are assurance. Now, what does that mean? A functional security requirement actually, actually has to do with implementing a specific capability. Like if you want to put in access control mechanisms, those are functions 
that are actually installed in the operating system or part of the hardware. The same thing with some of the identification authentication technology, multi-factor authentication. Those are mechanisms for the most part, functional. Assurance has to do with confidence that that functional capability has actually been achieved or implemented. And that's where, and this actually started back in the common criteria. A lot of folks out there might not know that there's NISO standard, it's 15408 common criteria. It has three different volumes. There's a model in volume one, there's a whole volume of security functional requirements, and then there's a whole volume of security assurance requirements. And a lot of what's in the original 853 was guided and informed by that international standard. So you'll see assignment statements in that standard, selection statements, and things that you would recognize as having emerged in 853. There was a reason for that. So assurance requirements and assurance-related controls have to do with how the capability is developed or achieved. So you're going to see those are more of the things that look at the developmental process, uh, using secure coding techniques, testing, evaluation, regression testing, pen testing, all of the types of things that are done to really give you confidence that what you've implemented, what you've done uh, in a control or a requirement is implemented correctly, operating as intended and producing the desired effect to meeting whatever your security policy is. So independent assessment and assessments in general are an assurance requirement. Why do you do assessments? Well, it's to see if what you had in your security plan actually got done or how much of it got done or how well did it get done. That gives the system owner or the authorizing official greater confidence that whatever vulnerabilities existed before that I tried to apply this set of controls or requirements to mitigate, some of those worked out well, some of those became residual vulnerabilities because I couldn't close them down, but all of that residual, um, those residual vulnerabilities translate to residual risk, which has to be accepted or not accepted by the authorizing official. So, we clearly looked at this independent assessment requirement as being an assurance requirement. Sure. And yeah. that's why you can make an argument that it really doesn't directly affect the confidentiality of CUI. Now, simply well, let, say, me, well, let me jump oh, in. Oh, let me jump in know? real fast. So I know that I know I don't want to dwell on the independent assessment thing too much because I'm sure there's going to be lots of public comments. However, you know, it, talking about this federal non-federal perspective uh, right. idea. From the federal perspective, I mean, it has to be very clear after now many, many years of 171 being on the street and being mostly not verified that unless there is a verification mechanism, and this is what we see playing out in the defense space specifically with their CMMC program, unless there is a verification mechanism, I would assume that the government knows by now that you have far lower assurance that these requirements are being implemented as a minimum baseline to protect the confidentiality of the government's data. So wouldn't that directly make a control like independent assessment rel related to being categorized into the baseline? To say yes. that it's not related to confidentiality when we know that the controls aren't being implemented seems like a bit of a stretch to me personally. Well, it's not It's not a stretch if you think about what assurance is in its pure context. It's, it's to develop confidence that the solutions that were implemented are actually as they as they should be. So, I mean, it's like if a tree falls in the, in the woods, if nobody hears it, did the tree actually fall and make noise? I mean, you, you can, it's kind of, it becomes a philosophical argument. Now, the other thing that guided and informed us in this regard is that the fact that we didn't put that in the 173, um, 171 Rev 3, that doesn't change the, the CMMC program is sure. always yeah. about that anyway. So that independent assessment was going to be hardwired into the program. So it doesn't really affect sure. the program that way. And you could also make the same argument for those on the outside the CMMC program who are in different federal agencies. There's nothing stopping a federal agency from going the extra mile and saying, here are the 171 requirements. And in addition to that, I want you to provide me with the results of an independent third party assessment. Now you'd have to put that as an, uh, a different requirement in, in the actual contract or the agreement, but nonetheless, it's possible if that assurance is necessary for you to have that level of um, 
kind of uh, confidence in, in the solution. Now, the other thing is, is that, um, yeah, of course, that goes also, there are also some uh, some words in the, the Rev3 that you can pick out called verified. Whenever you see the term verified, you should start thinking about that's an assurance requirement. Mm -hmm. um, so assurance has always been important. It's probably going to be critically important going forward in the commercial product space because you can see You've heard a lot about the SBOM work, the, the software bill of materials. That's kind of just dipping the toe in the, in the pond. We're trying to get more evidence. We're trying to get more transparency. What's going on inside that commercial product black box? We know you guys do a good job of developing, but what kind of processes and procedures did you use to build that operating system or that firewall? Yeah. What kind of security functions did you put into that product that I now have to put into my critical systems. And if this is like a pacemaker or in a braking system that's going into a 2024, 2025 automobile, you see assurance becomes pretty darn important, especially if you're at NASA, you're building a next generation you know, manned mission. Right. Those are pretty heady issues that you can't ignore. The question is in this environment with the 171 Rev3, putting it in, did that bias anything more than the agency could achieve through either the CMMC program or through a federal agency putting into their agreement offline. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Well, so let, maybe let's just get into some of the changes here from a formatting perspective. So one of the main themes in the start of 171, as you talked about earlier, is combining requirements for ease of use. Uh, now, I know you don't like it when people start counting things up. However, that is uh, definitely what happens in the non-federal perspective. And the process of combining requirements as they exist in the final draft, uh, takes us from 110, what appears to be 110 requirements in Rev2 to 95 requirements in the final draft, which to most people appears to be a reduction on the surface. But under the surface, comparing 171A to the draft of 171A R3 is a sort of sig significant increase. And so I agree with the idea that maybe something should be combined for ease of use, but I think that when the documents are separate, that's what causes this counting disparity. And you mentioned earlier that NIST was eager to, uh, you know, reduce the number of various documents. Why not just make 171 and 171A a single document so that we don't have this counting disparity and it also reduces the number of documents? Is that a consideration that NIST might make? You know, it, it could be a consideration, but I'm hoping that the CPRT and the online version of both these publications will subsume the need for that. Now, I understand your point. We have looked at this problem through a whole bunch of different documents. I had people ask me to put in 53 alpha and combine it with 53. <laughs> and of course, over the years, you've seen not only did not we not do that, we also started moving lots of stuff out right. of 53, like we did 53 Bravo for the baselines. Right. We, we, we try to have a rationale for why we do things. We moved the baselines out because we didn't want the catalog, we wanted the catalog to be the great parts bin. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want that to be only for people who were using the baselines in the RMF. What about people who don't use the RMF who just like the controls? Right. So yes, in some sense, you could move the 171 alpha content. I can do that with about three or four clicks of the mouse. Sure. <laughs> and moving well, that'll, be, that'll definitely be one of my, uh, one of my comments as well. Uh, I think that uh, as much as I love counting them and then making memes about the differences between the two <laughs> documents, uh, I think that, I think that within the domain of the CMMC world, I think they got it right by making it a single document. I think that that's something that maybe NIST uh, should consider because then you just put it all together and then any combination doesn't really yield these disparities. Now, on that note, though, of whether they're two different documents or single documents, here's some percentages uh, very quickly. So most of the tailoring decisions, we talked about tailoring earlier, it could be tailoring things into the baseline, it could be tailoring things out of the baseline, depending on the situation. However, so far, it seems like all the tailoring decisions for 171 in previous revisions and this current set of revisions is tailoring things out of the moderate baseline. The right. 53 Rev 5 moderate baseline is less than 30% of the parts bin overall. Would NIST ever consider tailoring in a control or a, a part of a control that is not in the moderate baseline, whether it's assigned to a baseline or it's in the high baseline, or is it is the is the moderate baseline the theoretical ceiling to 171? 
it's the theoretical ceiling. And I'll tell you where, where you're more likely to see that is things added to 172. Gotcha. Because that's a cleaner solution. We don't want to really tamper with that theoretical baseline because okay. then it really defeats the purpose of using that to begin with. The executive order really didn't give us carte blanche to add stuff. You know, the, not when NARA did the moderate baseline, that was their decision and they're the executive agent. So it's not up to NIST to kind of tailor up from that. Now, customers can always do that, but we do have a lane where we can add things like you're suggesting, and that would be in the 172. That's why I said earlier, don't be surprised if you see um, a significant number of new things going into 172 for that specific reason. Gotcha. Um, okay. You know, so as far as, as far as the categorization, you know, just to, to sort of look at categorization for a little bit longer. So as far as the categorization goes, uh, 853 revision five did add new things to the moderate baseline. Uh, it wasn't just that sort of existing 853 controls were upgraded to the moderate baseline. There's sort of net right. new controls. And uh, by my by my count, forgive me for counting, there are 47 new additions to the Rev 5 moderate baseline. In the initial draft, most of them were categorized as CUI relevant. In this final draft, uh, only you know 15 or, or pieces of 15 of those new controls are represented in the final draft. Um, you know, just at a high level, sort of what changed? I mean, is that? Did, I mean, just a second look, public comments, like. You know, was there, that seems to be the biggest change to me between the yeah, drafts. It's, it's all the above. It's a second okay. look, it's public comments. And they either went, of course, the NFOs either went to actually a CUI mm -hmm. category or they were eliminated or they could have gone to the ORC. Most of the things you're talking about in that 47 either went to NCO or ORC. So either way, NIST made the call that this, particular control or requirement now in 171 was not directly related to the unauthorized disclosure of CUI, or it was adequately covered by other controls in that baseline, which were always there before. But this is where the public comment was very really helpful. It pointed out the redundancy that I always knew was there, but boy, I'll tell you, nothing gets by the public commenters. They found yeah. that redundancy and then they, they weighed in on it. So, so let's let's talk about the ORC thing here as as we wrap up. So, here's my take on the ORC. So, we just got done revising 853. Just got done back in you know not too long ago. We just revised 853 to revision five, and the revision process withdraws controls, moves them to other controls, integrates them or incorporates them into other controls to eliminate this redundancy. So, over the course of the revision cycle of 853 we've watched a lot of redundancy get removed to the point where when you look at 53 they all seem relatively distinct the controls and their enhancements um it seems odd to me that you could read the abstractions of 853 controls in 8171 and use that as the basis for determining that there is a bunch of redundancy in 853 when it was just revised to me it seems like the appearance of redundancy, I think, is an illusion sort of cast by the f the way that the requirements are abstracted in 800-171. You know, is it really true that there was that level of redundancy to be categorized as ORC? Because, you know, I'm sure there'll be lots of public comments on the ORC, but it just seems odd to me. It seems sort of out of it seems out of sequence that we're identifying redundancies in the derivative document rather than the source document that was just revised. Well, first, let me say that you know how big 853 is, and it's grown organically over the past, let's see, we're almost coming up on 20 years in another year or so. There's going to be natural redundancy in that. I wouldn't say it's an overwhelming amount of redundancy, but one of the things that's really good of going back years after those controls and enhancements were developed is that you can see some of that redundancy now that it's being looked at under a microscope or with a magnifying glass. So part of the process of going through the 171 Rev 3 is it's exposing some of that redundancy. Some of that will likely be addressed in the future revisions of 853. Even some of the wording in 53, we've learned some things about how things are structured and worded that we'd like to maybe change over time. Mm -hmm. The other thing is 
Some of that redundancy, as I said earlier, was not harmful. It was a natural outgrowth of overlapping controls. There's, you know, controls are not always, they look distinct, but when you get down to the implementation, a lot of these controls are mutually reinforcing, some are even overlapping. Right. And you can have an entire podcast about that. Sure. But suffice to say, we erred on the side of a little bit of a lighter touch on our overlapping and redundancy decisions. Because we know eventually we're moving back to 53. So anything that has to be tightened up will get resolved as that journey goes down to that CUI overlay. But for now, I think, and this is what the public comments are going to tell us, as you said, Jacob, people are going to look at the ORCs. First thing, understand what the ORCs mean and why we have that category. And then look at the controls that are actually categorized as ORC. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at our website, and Vicky had, uh, we actually went through this and developed every one, every time we made an ORC decision, we had to go back and say, okay, what control actually covers that? Right. And we had a whole dialogue about that. And I'll tell you, I'm just going to throw out a number out there uh, of, let's say we had 40 ORCs. After Vicky and I, Vicky went back and looked at the second look at that, and I had to go back and Reinforce my rationale, justify. Sometimes I would back off and say, okay, that really does need to stay in. You know, it's these kind of judgment calls that we're making as we put this these categorization decisions together. Now, the public comments, again, understand what ORCs are. Go see what what the uh, terms mean and why we did that to this particular control. What actually covers that control from our perspective? And if you think it was an overreach, then you can certainly ask for that to go back to CUI. We'll be glad to put it back in. Um, on the other hand, if you think we um, didn't go far enough, you, you could go the other way. You sure. can say, well, here's a few more that I think are overlapping. And again, we love the discussion because when you have a discussion, you actually learn things, you get different perspectives. And if we can all keep focused on one kind of guiding principle, does what's left in there actually do the job in right. protecting controlled unclass information? If you can stand up at the end of the day and say that with a straight face, number of controls, number of enhancements, number of requirements, <laughs> all that stuff doesn't matter if it's actually doing the job and people can actually execute. Execution is what brings down most even great control frameworks. Yeah, it's even a, if you only have a single control, if you don't execute, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Right? So I hope that answered your question. Lisa. No, absolutely. So, I absolutely. mean, in that sense, you know, I think we covered a huge swath of topics around the drafts, where they came from, what's happening, where they're going, some of the specific changes. As you said, I always recommend to people, use the comment matrix, look at Appendix C for your structural changes and comments, look at the text of the requirements for your editorial and sort of substance changes, I think, to wording and things like that. You know, as we wrap up, and head into this public comment period, head into the holidays on this glide path to the final revision. What do you have anything that you'd like to sort of convey to people listening? How should they, you know, think about this process as we move forward? Well, I just want to again close out by saying how much I appreciate, admire, and take my hat off and salute all the people out there in our community. I'm, I'm talking about our community writ large people that are developing the standards and guidelines, people that are on the cutting edge of implementing all these things. We're all trying to do the right thing. One team, one mission. It's a hard problem. It's difficult. It's challenging. And again, my appreciation goes out to everybody who takes the time to comment. And you can be assured that your comments, every one of them will get read and analyzed and looked at. I can't always guarantee we're going to come down on the side that you would like, but you I can guarantee we're going to give you a fair, a fair shot. And uh, again, I'd like to give a shout out to you and Jason and all the folks uh, it, on your crew there. Um, it's enormously helpful to be able to have these rather lengthy and some would argue maybe boring. I know you don't consider them boring discussions, but you know, one of the things that we always lack is an understanding of why we're doing all the things we're doing. And your podcasts have given us the opportunity to explain the why Still, it's not going to make it any less painful, but sometimes when you look at the overall, the big picture, it gives you a better perspective of some of the things that we are doing, why we're doing them. And it also will help you make 
more informed comments on how you can change things that maybe still can be changed. So again, I hope everybody has a happy holiday period reviewing all the stuff. And, and we're looking forward to January the 12th when we get all your feedback. And I'm looking forward to coming back maybe um, after we get all this stuff done and doing mm -hmm. a retrospective. Yeah. Anytime you say the word and, uh, and uh, when we get the final revisions out, then we'll definitely be eager to have you back on. Uh, Dr. Ross, thank you for always being so gracious with your time. Thanks for going into all the details. I know everybody appreciates it. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple months. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Dr. Ross. Take care.